Jason Kasuga, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Laura. Appreciate the opportunity. So um, we're talking right now the second week in June, still early June. How do things look for water supplies on the middle Rio Grande right now? Yeah, Laura, that's a tough question. And I wish I had better news, but it's, it's not looking very good. Um, as we uh, were ending, as we began May, uh, we had quite a bit of water. Um, spring runoff was coming down. Uh, but I, what, what I don't think folks realize is it was coming down early, uh, which meant that it was going to end early. And we're seeing that process of um, the amount of native water that we have available to us in the Middle Rio Grande coming to an end. And the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District this week started, um, or uh, late last week started, release of our San Juan Chama water to augment native flow, which is um, very early on when we would normally have to start doing that. So I would say the water situation, unfortunately, is is looking pr pretty bleak. So what can farmers expect, do you think, in the coming weeks? So we're gonna just face generally a downward trend on the amount of water that we can divert uh, to the point where uh, we won't divert anything else. Uh, we're gonna reach a point in time where um, water delivery to non-Pueblo farmers will kick in and we'll only be delivering what we call prior and paramount water uh, to, to uh, um, tribal communities and uh, short of getting rain the amount of water that um, non-tribal farmers can expect is going to be very little and in some cases none. Mm -hmm. So MRGCD held a special meeting at the end of May and I heard you say in that meeting multiple times that if irrigation deliveries are stopped in the coming weeks that doesn't mean that the district has ended the irrigation season it means that there's no water. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, oftentimes I think uh, when we're talking in our board meetings, people um, get this idea that we at the MRGCD are literally turning off the faucet, if you will. And in this instance, we are not. MRGCD will be open for business, and if we have water to route and move um, to farmers, we will do that. The problem is, is we are just running out of the precious resource that we route to farmers. And so without rain, I expect maybe as early as the 15th of this month um, to, to have very little to no water um, to divert and to deliver to um, our non-Pueblo agricultural community right now. Uh, and that will stay that way until we get rain and if we get rain. And if we get a substantial amount of rain where we can divert that and route it to farmers, we will do that. Uh, so in that sense, we are open for business. We just don't have the resource uh, to deliver to, to folks. So I'm sure that, I, I know that farmers in the district uh, understand this, but I just kind of wanted to lay out for, for the audience, like the Rio Grande isn't necessarily like just a naturally flowing river anymore. There's a series of reservoirs and diversions and, and the water moves from place to place and different, um, different states, different entities have different water rights that can be held in different reservoirs. Where does the MRGCD store its water and what's the status of, of that stored water right now? So Laura, historically, MRGC has stored its water at El Vado Dam. Um, El Vado Dam is owned and operated um, by the Bureau of Reclamation and uh, MRGCD is the um, non-federal um, partner with Reclamation with El Vado. We pay O&M for it, but the Bureau of Reclamation manages it and does all the operations. And uh, El Vado Dam is currently going through a rehabilitation under the Bureau of Reclamation Safety of Dam prog Program. And so it is not available to us um, to store native water. And so with, without having the ability to store water, we, we truly are what we call a run of the river system. We are beholden to what um, is produced in the upper elevations uh, from a snowpack standpoint or from the amount of rain that we get. And uh, we have no really ability to supplement that um, through native storage. One of the other things I think is worth mentioning there is that New Mexico is um, currently in debt under the Rio Grande Compact, uh, which also limits our ability to store um, and would limit our ability to store even if Elvada was functioning. And so, yeah, we just face a almost a perfect storm, extreme drought, infrastructure that has to be fixed, and 
than a, the debt under the Rio Grande Compact affecting this, the Middle Valley. I mean, it's all coming to a head at one time. So we've seen the river in steady decline for decades, and we've seen temperatures rising for decades. Um, it feels to me like this year shouldn't be a huge surprise to people, um, and yet, and and yet it feels like a crisis. Do you know, like, how are farmers planning to adapt to this year? Well, I think it's different across the board. I think you have seen some of the farming community adapt um, and adapt uh, previously uh, as, as we had kind of signs of what was coming, um, drier years. Uh, but realistically, what I tell our team at the MRGCD is I don't think anybody has faced what we're facing from a management standpoint this year. Um, not having El Vado Dam, the extent to being in compact debt that we are, and then the conditions that we have related to the drought. Right, and so the, I think what the drought is going to do, and I say the drought because even if we get the infrastructure fixed and we um, get more in compliance with our compact debt, I do think we're going to face a hydrologic reality where we're just producing, the system is producing less water. And so um, I think that we have enough infrastructure on this river uh, to not just weather it, but hopefully to thrive. But there's a lot of work to be done, um, both on the farming side, looking at um, the efficiency operation um, within um, an individual farmer's field. Um, MRGCD is doing that same thing now as we look at our system. How can we move water more efficiently and get it to farms more efficiently? And then any type of infrastructure farmers need to invest in for drought resiliency. Um, I know many farmers have invested in drought resiliency wells that they can supplement uh, when the district can't make deliveries. And I, I think folks are going to have to take more realis a more realistic look at that uh, as they go forward uh, because I, I expect um, that we will continue to face a very diff difficult hydrologic reality for some time. Um, that is not something, well I hope it's different. and. Um, my wish is, it's, is it that it's different. I just don't think that's what um, that we're seeing, and I don't think it's going to be a trend that turns around um, very quickly. Are there concerns that as people can't get surface water, that they start drilling more for drilling wells and using groundwater? And could we potentially kind of end up in a situation like in the lower Rio Grande where there's compact issues between Texas and New Mexico because of that groundwater pumping? Yeah, I th um, Laura, I think that uh, as we, as I look down on that lower section and um, the implications down there and just then look at the Middle Valley, I think there's, um, it's right to be concerned with um, pumping and the degree, I think one of the things that we as New Mexicans will have to do is uh, put in systems, I think, to monitor that pumping, uh, to, to essentially take that bull by the horns, and because uh, I think that's what it's going to take, because it is the same cup of water, right? Um, I was explaining this to um, a different individual the other day. Imagine a cup of water with a straw in it, you know, surface water drinks it from the top, pumping just uh, drinks it from the bottom. Right, and so it is the same cup, and I think we have to be mindful of that. I do think there is a right balance that we can get to, uh, but the, the, on MRGCD side, we don't manage wells. Um, that really comes from the Office of the State Engineer. Um, our game is um, is primarily in surface water, right, from a delivery standpoint. So there is, I think, needs to be collaboration and coordination, um, get a better understanding of the amount of pumping that's already going on in the Middle Valley that maybe we don't know about, mm -hmm. which I think there is quite a bit of pumping that's going on in the Middle Valley that we don't know about, and start slowly but surely bringing that into um, an understanding and regulating that. And, uh, but I think nothing can be off the board right now. I think the drought is going to be a great equalizer in this, and it's going to cause us to um, continue to to look at these things and get better. And I say drought, um, and I mean just our hydrologic reality right now, because drought sometimes implies that it's coming and going, and right. I just don't know if that's what we're seeing. And so um, I, I think the right term is our current hydrologic reality, and, and that may be, it may be this way for some time. So I don't want to scare people, but I, I want to underscore the seriousness of this year. So Jason, any final words about you know, the outlook for this summer? 
Yeah, and I don't know if, um, and it may scare folks, but that's not my intent. My intent, I think, and my job is to um, speak the truth and be transparent. Um, I think people deserve to know how difficult it's going to be. Um, and hopefully, Laura, what I'm hoping by opportunities like this and other times I've been able to talk with, with, with the media is that we can get the message out there. Um, I still think there's a lot of folks in the Middle Valley that are not in tune from a water situation on what we're facing, not just in the Middle Valley, but in New Mexico as a whole. Um, what we're facing, I think, the community needs to understand is not exclusive to New Mexico. If you look at the greater part of the Southwest, um, from a drought watch standpoint, we are either in um, exceptional to severe drought. Um, that's, uh, that's a reality for the whole Southwest. What we're dealing with in the Middle Valley is the same, just on a different scale to what they're de dealing with on the Colorado River. Uh, and so uh, what I want to tell folks um, in the community is that um, I think there's a path forward, uh, but I do think that the conversation on drought, how we manage our water, I think the conversations we need to have among our federal agencies and some of the overlapping authorities that limit, I think, the usefulness of infrastructure that we have has to be an important conversation going forward because I don't know that this river needs more infrastructure. Um, it needs to make use of the infrastructure that we have. And the more people that know about this issue, I can, I think, then can begin to influence, I think, some of these changes um, from authorities uh, to um, laws, if laws need to be changed and, and partnerships that need to, be, need to be had. But that starts by getting the community informed about what we face, right? And I will say, that I'm getting more and more calls now um, from folks that are just not even in the benefited area of the district trying to understand what the communities that they are historically going to, like if they visit Corrales or they visit the Bosque um, or they um, go north a little bit and, and like to hike along um, the river, right? The more folks that get involved, I think, can help turn these conversations as we as we deal with these infrastructure issues, these um, authorities, uh, and, and hopefully get all of us water management agencies generally marching in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Well, Jason, thanks so much for talking with me. Appreciate the opportunity, Gloria. Thank you very much.